So hi everyone and welcome to another Play UK webinar organized by British Council. I am Ljubica Garic and I will be your host today. This is already our fifth webinar. So far we talked about art, programming, the business of games and today's topic is the potential of cross-disciplinary practices, which is fitting since Play UK is focused on innovation in games and interaction between art and technology. Play UK is now a digital event, don't forget that. So along with this live session, we prepared talks and lectures from our UK experts, which are all available online. Before we get started with today's uh, webinar, a few service information. This session will run for about 90 minutes. Uh, today's talk should be an immersive experience and we wouldn't want to affect that. So unlike our previous sessions, uh, we will be answering all our questions after the talk but still make sure to write all your questions down in the Q&A box. Don't forget that this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to British Council's website and YouTube channel and also sent to you by email in the following days. Well, now that uh, now that that's out of the way, we can begin with today's session. Uh, our today's guest is uh, Dr. Mona Bosdog, a designer and lecturer in immersive experience design at Aberté University. Hi, Mona, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to have you here with us. Hello. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope you can all hear me OK. <laughs> I think, My internet has been acting out, so fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. It can only get better from here, Mona. No, no worries. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I want to thank again all attendees for being patient and for waiting for a couple of minutes. We were experiencing some technical issues, but that's out of the way now. Uh, so Mona, can we start with you telling us a bit about yourself and what you will be sharing with us today? Sure, um, I am Mona and I think uh, Lubitsa has already kind of perfectly introduced me. Um, I work at Aberté University where I'm a lecturer in immersive experience design. Um, I'm also a practitioner as well as a researcher um, and collectively through Aberté University we make work um, as part of Aberté Game Lab. Um, which is a collective of practitioners and researchers. Um, I guess today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I got to where I am today because my background is in theater um, and I'll be emphasizing some of the, the ways in which we, which we can approach video games uh, via a performance background, I guess. That sounds that sounds awesome. I'm sure that um, all attendees are super excited to hear to hear uh, your lecture today. OK, so. And then shall I uh, yeah, try so to get the yeah, let's begin. Let's take off. <laughs> um, OK. So again, Mona will be um, talking uh, talking through the, this project and also will be playing uh, videos and uh, music scores. So we won't interrupt this experience with questions, but please make sure to write them all down and we will uh, ask um, Mona all your questions after her lecture is finished. Yeah, um... let's enjoy this. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping I've shared my slides with you all and you can see them OK. Yes, everything seems fine. Everything seems fine um, and I've not shared my notes. No, nope, those are <laughs> hidden. OK, <laughs> okay. No great. Sorry, um, this is my first um, online live uh, presentation, so I'm a bit nervous about the technology, so please bear with me and apologies for keep asking uh, silly questions. Um, first of all, hi everyone. Um, it's really lovely to be here. So I want to thank the people who made it possible, the lovely, lovely and very patient team at British Council uh, Western Balkans for the invitation and also the wonderful We Throw Switches for recommending me year after year after year until eventually I got here. Um, and also I want to thank you all for, for tuning in. Today I really want to talk about my favorite things, um, which are performance and play. 
particularly the really exciting areas where the two overlap. Um, my practice and my research are both located here and they both stem for my firm belief that there is so much potential for creative exploration here. Um, but as any storyteller knows, we must begin at the beginning. Um, long, long time ago, I made a career in theater, initially as a playwright and later expanding my practice to directing and dramaturgy. I made performances which blurred the boundaries between audience and performance, which blurred um, 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 and, and explored alternative forms of storytelling, basically, which interrogated what it means to be present. Um, but Gradually, I kind of started to discover that being present and being able to act are oftentimes synonymous. Um, and this discovery in turn prompted me to start exploring the endless potential of video games. Um, at this time, I also discovered the PhD opportunity, which called for applications for a research project that was called Connecting Performance and Play, establishing interdisciplinary design methods for the development of video games and performance. And this was a partnership between Aberte Royal Conservator of Scotland, the National Theatre of Scotland, and it was funded through the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities, Arlings, and the Scottish Founding Council. The project, as its name suggests, was preoccupied with the development of interdisciplinary design methods, which drew from contemporary performance and video games, so bringing those two fields together. Um, I applied um, and to my great surprise, as I had no experience or knowledge of video games at this point, um, I got it. Um, <laughs> and as part of my PhD, I developed two mixed reality multimedia events, which blended elements of performance with video games. Um, but you will hear more about the, the first of these two projects uh, today. I now make games. Um, and these games usually allow people to come together um, to challenge themselves and the things that they know, which make people laugh and hold hands with strangers sometimes, um, which allow players to perform conviviality, community and solidarity, and which teach people to watch each other's backs. Um, all the games that you see here were intended for a social setting and they used a similar design approach. So combining digital and physical elements to enhance the social potential of video games, which is something that I'm really passionate about. But back to my humble beginnings. Um, for me, as an outsider to video games, the way to better understand in order to learn from them was to translate them and was to filter them through what I was familiar with, the language of performance. Today, I want to talk to you about this process in the hopes that it can inspire and that it can motivate more storytellers to look at video games as a playground, as an endlessly stimulating medium that can teach us how to trust our listeners, how to let go of authorial control and embrace the co-creation of meaning. So let's start once again at the beginning. The year is 2012 and the Chinese room launched The Arrester. The Arrester goes on to shape video game history and define a new genre, the walking simulator. Walking simulators renounce traditional game tropes and foreground walking as an aesthetic and as a dramaturgical practice, which engages the walker or, or the player, if you will, in critical acts of reading, challenging or performing a landscape. Since the launch of the arrester, multiple titles have emerged that adopt and reclaim the term walking simulator, which was coined in the region of precisely their narrative reach and literary nature and their perceived lack of what gamers usually call traditional gameplay. Uh, and this was done by a frustrated player community, and this frustration was directed towards the alternative style of gameplay. So walking sims had no traditional objectives, no challenges or rewards, few interaction schemes and in-game actions. In walking sim, the player mostly walks through the game world, interacting with its objects and environments. Because the main in-game action is walking, they are accessible to a diverse player community, regardless of their previous gaming knowledge. Additionally, this limited palette in terms of mechanics acts as a creative constraint, stimulating the developers to deploy all the other tools in their design toolbox for generating atmosphere and conveying the narrative. If the player mostly walks, 
which requires a minimum of attention. Therefore, she is free to focus on the aesthetic experience provided by the game. The arrestor strands the player in a virtual representation of Bora in Sinkild Archipelago to explore its histories, legends, and ghosts and discover the story behind its enigmatic narrator. As you walk around the island, you trigger snippets of voiceover narration and encounter moments of environmental storytelling. The game is a poetic meditation on guilt, loss and redemption, which unfolds as the player explores the desolate island. The game's island is haunting and beautiful, narrative and sensorially rich, evocative and symbolically charged, uninhabited except for gulls, ghosts and legends. To focus the player's attention on the environment and the narrative, the designers have stripped down the game's mechanics to a bare minimum. The only permitted in-game actions are walking, limited swimming, zooming in and looking around. This impossibility to interact with the objects or manipulate them supports an interpretation of the island as a liminal space, a purgatory of sorts, where the characters must confront and accept his own path in order to achieve absolution and redemption. You cannot change this island in any way because the island haunts the player, the player haunts the island, or both. Furthermore, it is our virtual body which walks its paths while as our physical body guides it from a keyboard and watches it on a screen. We are, therefore, one of the island's ghosts. Casting the player as a ghost is another design strategy that I adopted, but more of that a little bit later. That was nice, wasn't it? As most of you are watching this from the comfort of your homes, I reckon that by now you would have gotten comfortable and possibly quite sleepy. So I'll do the unheard of and take a leap in time to shake off the slumber. The year is now 2016, and 50 invited guests from video games and performance backgrounds arrive on Inchcombe Island in the Firth of Forth in Scotland to attend a live adaptation of Dear Esther as a site-responsive promenade performance. For the following two hours, they wandered the island to encounter moments of storytelling and various forms of installations. Inchcombe Project was a hybrid experience which combined elements of performance, video games and live music. It was structured as a three-part event. First, a promenade performance, which was an adaptation of Dear Esther called Dear Rachel, then a gameplay projection. Um, the arrestor was being played live and projected onto the Inchcolm Abbey wall. And finally, a musical performance. So I worked with a collective of musicians from Edinburgh that are called Mantra Collective and who specialize in video game music. Um, and they arranged and performed the arrestor's soundtrack live in the 12th century Inchcolm Abbey. So it was a complete experience. Being a loosely adapted text, Dear Rachel, so the first part of this three-part experience, was a constant negotiation between the source text and the potential text. This potential text was equally shaped by the site, so its symbolic potential added another dramaturgical layer to the narrative, its stories and histories were embodied by its environment, and its physical appearance constantly shaped the structure of the text. These three functions of the site as symbol, as structure, and as storyteller shaped the text by guiding its reception, so where we experience that text, by shaping its themes, so the text was site responsive, and finally by aiding its semiotic and sensory interpretation. The, the symbols of the island uh, as refuge and prison eventually grew into the theme of the performance. Please try to remember these three functions of the site, as I will return to them in just a little bit. As the audience explored the liminal space of the island, its boundaries and legends, they encountered the many ghosts of Inchcomb Island. These were characters stuck in limbo who were performing their actions in a loop. They, some of them were staring in the distance, others were drinking tea, others were playing musical instruments. Um, but they also encountered the disembodied voice and an ethereal sound memories rendered audib audible through a geotagging app, um, which was called Sonic Maps. 
um, but also refugee crisis imagery that was nested in the ruined environments and sites of ritual. These ghosts were 10 installations and 22 audio files hidden on the island. Using the map that you see here, uh, the audience journeyed on Inchcom and in the arrester in search for meaning. As they explored the island, uh, the sonic maps app running on their phones would trigger one of the 22 geotagged audio files. You can see this mark on the map with one of the little paper boats, um, 22 in total. Um, but they could also encounter the visual installations or the musicians who are also positioned in specific locations around the island. Um, these are represented on the map um, through those abstracted symbols. Um, but I'll return to this a little bit later as well. In adapting the arrester, I wanted us to build on its design, while at the same time to create a new piece of site responsive work. Um, the motivation be behind this was twofold. So I wanted to emphasize how DRSR and by extension games can engage with meaningful stories and current concerns, while at the same time exploring how I could create an overarching narrative theme and common setting that would connect the performance and the game. Um, developing in Shon project has involved complex processes of adaptation um, of a game and to a site and dramaturgy of assemblage and synesthetics which saved the design strategies, techniques and, and tools deployed in its making. The hybrid nature of the project, so we had live and virtual components, demanded that I develop interdisciplinary working methods, borrowing from both game design and performance practice. So the first step in doing so was to select a game and a site that were suitable and evocative of one another. Next, I also wanted to understand how the arrester manages to create a meaningful gameplay experience, and this involved the process of reverse engineering its design, going behind the gameplay experience, um, as it were, to analyze the design strategies which underpinned its visual style and environments, its narrative, its sound, and its interaction design. These design strategies were then adapted to Inchcom Island, filtered through Inchcom's presence. Now, please bear with me a little as we take a brief walk through the land of adaptation theory. Exciting, I know. Um, one of the many pleasures of adaptation is tracing the connections between an original and an adapted text, um, which has been called the doubled pleasure of the palimpsest, so knowingly experiencing more than one text at the same time. It is perhaps worth noting um, that the arrester, which started life as a mod, it was itself an, an adaptation or it was grafted onto Half-Life 2. Adaptation is both an active process of creation, but also an active process of reception. As Hutchin notes, adaptation is a form of intertextuality. We experience adaptations as palimpsests through our memory of other works that resonate through repetition with variation. So we constantly remember both texts. Seen as a process, adaptation is a constant negotiation between the existing text and the potential text. So me as a maker, I'm constantly doing this negotiation um, in what to keep and what to build on. Furthermore, in Inchcom project, the adaptation and the source text were brought together. The audience walked around the island and experiences the adapted text, but also the original text as they watched the curated playthrough of the arrester. Um, the curators, and worth mentioning here, were none other than we throw switches that many of you are familiar with by now. Um, the temporal and spatial proximity in which the audience experienced the two texts, so they experienced Dear Rachel followed by Dear Esther, generated a deja vu sensation between the game and the performance. Um, this intertextual relationship was heightened because I intended to draw attention to the similarities between the game and the performance, and in doing so to blur these lines between the real and the fictional, and between the physical and the virtual worlds and bodies, which is the area that I was really interested in. Adaptation thus offered me a way of creating a response to the arrester, but in a medium whose conventions, methods and techniques were familiar to me. It also offered me a practical way of researching and understanding the conventions and strategies of video games. 
not unlike fan culture then, adaptation and in my case remediation, so moving that text from one medium into another, democratized the process of creation. Jenkins refers to fan culture creations as textual poaching, which perfectly captures the reader's desire to possess a text. And Jenkins further argues that creating content based on the work they love, fans actually engage in creative acts of adaptation and then thus make the work their own, contributing their own unique vision to the text. This grassroots creativity, which operates at the fringes of mainstream media, diversifies, expands and challenges it and is illustrative of the creative potential of participation. As Jenkins reminds us, the power of participation comes not from destroying commercial culture, but from writing over it, modding it, amending it, expanding it, adding greater diversity of perspective, and then recirculating it, feeding it back into the mainstream media, which is exactly what we were doing with Inchon Project. In what follows, I will reflect on the process of adapting the arrester and elaborate a little bit on these steps that I took during the process. When I talk about the selection process, I usually refer to selecting a game and a site which were not just suitable to being adapted, but would also benefit from this process. Um, for a game to be adapted to an interactive performance, of course, the actions or the mechanics of the game needs to be performable, if you want, by a physical body in a physical environment. So walking, puzzle solving, scavenging, listening, taking photos, drawing were all mechanics that I could adapt, whereas things like shooting, swimming, climbing, driving or parkour, for example, were not or were not as easy <laughs> to adapt. Um, at the same time, I wanted the performance to be first and foremost a sensory and a narrative experience, which meant that I was not interested in win conditions, competitive mechanics or traditional goals like scoring points or gaining collectibles, which is why I narrowed down the pool of potential games to only include first person non competitive narrative games. I played through a mix of walking simulators, art and serious games, exploration and puzzle games and horror games. While all of them had something really unique to offer in terms of either immersive atmosphere, environments and sounds, or interesting forms of combining interaction with storytelling, none of them appealed or stayed with me as much as the arrester. This is perhaps because the arrester um, for me blends aspects from all the above genres that I find most interesting. So, for example, it takes the joy of exploration and discovery that we find in exploration games, but also the ease of navigation and intricate environmental storytelling that we find in walking simulators, the haunting atmosphere and the evocative sound that's usually found in horror games, uh, visual and poetic language and an emphasis of player driven meaning that we usually find in art and serious games, but also the cryptic and abstract narratives that we find in puzzle games. So it's a melange of all of these things. In adapting the arrester, I wanted to preserve all these elements, but also to explore the complex relationship between them, whilst at the same time to capture the changes and transformations that might occur in the process of its transformation into a live experience. So basically what happens when we translate this video game into a live environment? How real can a virtual um, world really become? The most important design choice that I made was that regardless of how I would structurally adapt the game, the setting must be an island. Now, you can imagine how glad my supervisors and our health and safety officer were at hearing this news, um, but the, the island in the arrest was the central part of my experience and it shaped all of the others, so I was pretty adamant. The feeling of isolation, loneliness and panic are supported by the fact that the player is stranded on a small and unfriendly piece of land surrounded by water. There is no way out unless she manages to unlock its secrets. I wanted to instill the same feeling um, in the audience while at the same time to take advantage of all the new sensations facilitated by the body being and moving on a Scottish island in mid-October. Mid Please read here rain and cold. Uh, the smells, textures, temperatures, sounds, taste, light and landscapes on Inchcombe Island were accessed through performance. 
Um, I also went through a site scouting phase in which I visited potential island locations and made a selection based on various criteria ranging from accessibility uh, and safety to access to facilities, but at the same time keeping the costs manageable. After numerous site visits, I decided that Inchcolm Island was the best option. It was evocative of the game environment, it was close to Edinburgh, and it operated as a tourist destination already, so it had facilities and health and safety protocols in place for accommodating participants. So, hooray there. Um, furthermore, I hope that you will agree that Inchcolm was remarkably aesthetically evocative of the game environment. Uninhabited, desolate, overgrown, it had a rich history that combines myth and legend with history. It had the same feel, sadness and loneliness, and it acted as a refuge and a prison. The game um, and the location were therefore evocative of one another. I'm going to let you take all this in. Um, so you can convince yourselves of the similarities. OK, so now with the game and site selected, it was time for me to get better acquainted with the game, the context of its development, its creators, as well as its reception and interpretation. The narrative and some of the environments are randomly selected, so in order to know the arrestor, multiple playthroughs were required. I played through the game repeatedly, taking notes and screenshots in my attempt to capture gameplay in a holistic way not just the in-game events, but also text, images, and sounds, which I found particularly resonant and rich. The more time I spent in the game world, the more I became familiar with it, and I found myself returning over and over again to certain places, sounds, and texts. These were then adapted in the live performance to create an illusion of continuity between the two islands, and thus blur the lines between the two texts, the two worlds, and the two realities. I also wanted to become familiar with the arrestor's reception and interpretation. This was not intended as a validation or invalidation of my own reading, rather a curiosity as to how others engaged with the game um, and the number of different interpretations supported and invited by the ambiguity embraced in its design. To this end, I read numerous reviews and comment threads, forums and wikis. The arrestor seems to still be as divisive in the game community as it was when it first launched. Furthermore, whenever a new game with the tag walking simulator is launched, the debate over whether they are games at all seems to be reignited. Despite all this noise, the arrestor fans were avidly trying to collectively make sense of the game's story and uncover all of the island's secrets. I also wanted to know more about the development and design processes, as well as the artistic intent behind the game. How certain artistic choices were made and why. What were the thought processes behind them? And if there was an optimal dramaturgy or critical path that the authors wanted to convey. Luckily, Dan Pinchback, Jessica Curry and Robert Briscoe were very open about their process. I found the Chinese Room's website and blog to be an invaluable resource alongside the director's commentary on the Dear Esther Landmark Edition, as well as the numerous talks and interviews that they gave. This helped me to get better acquainted with the game and improve my understanding and interpretation of the game and its design. I would argue that the process of interpretation started during the initial selection of the text because the selection process was biased. I have chosen games that appeal to me and then from this limited pool of games, I further selected one game that could be adapted. The selection is first a matter of taste and only after uh, practical considerations come into play. As previously discussed, adaptation is first appropriation and interpretation through one's sensibility, interests and talents. So taking into account my background as a playwright, I was interested in how I could adapt the poetic text. As a dramaturg, I wanted to recreate the openness of the text and to devise a way of walking um, as a, a sense and meaning making process. 
Um, and as an artist, I wanted to explore the narrative, symbolic and sensory opportunities afforded by an island space. So this is where my, my personal lens and the game kind of met. To adapt the game, I first wanted to really understand how it efficiently and successfully delivers its aesthetic experience. I argue that the arrester manages to do so through a combination of environment, narrative, sound, and interaction. To create a dreamlike experience, the writer and designer worked closely together. Um, with the artist and the sound designer um, and the eerie distillation alongside the ethereal music and text created ultimately an other worldly mood, which is reinforced by the inability to interact with any of the island's objects and environment. So the interaction comes into play as well. My question then became, how can I learn from this? How do I translate this to a live experience? And how do I translate this to a physical site? Um, I will try to answer this question later on as I address how each of these types of design were implemented in Inchcon project. The project responded to the site and to the game in equal measure, which is something that I call site and game responsive design. In order to achieve an aesthetic coherence between the game world and the site, my working methods, as I previously stated, had to constantly respond to both. Um, repeated playthroughs interspread with repeated site visits helped to further develop the concept and prompted new design ideas. In Inchcon project, the theme grew out of Inchcon Island's founding legend, but also out of Dear Esther's theme. And these visual symbols of refuge constantly linked the two worlds. At the same time, the moments of adapted environmental details similarly linked the arrestor to Inchcomb. So we had the paper boats, the candles, the feathers, eggs, and bird nests that united them. The design of Inchcomb project was simultaneously game and site responsive. I quickly realized that the site and, and this type of environmental storytelling is going to be a central aspect of the project and it will create the moments of connection between the arrestor and Inchcom. Inchcom project was utterly shaped by Inchcom Island. Its affordances and limitations impacted on the design. The island's physical presence impacted on how the performance was structured, how we worked with sound, where the installations and the musicians were stationed, the routes and the paths that could be explored, how we guide the navigation, how we use the locations that were inaccessible. Um, but the island's sensory potential was also employed to the full. So the smells, the sounds, the colors and the textures, the mood of some of its locations, the spaces that conveyed certain feelings like isolation or exposure or awe, for example. These functions of the site in site-specific work are summoned by Wilkie's observation that I mentioned before that site-specific performance engages with site as symbol, site as storyteller, and site as structure. See, as I promised, I have eventually returned to this. Site structures how we move, the rhythm of progression, it invites us to explore, and shows us the path. It conditions progression and challenges us to explore our physical prowess and rewards us with unforgettable and surprising vistas. Basically, it puts on a show for us. It also reveals its secrets to those who dare take on its challenges. It hosts the stories we want to tell, but it also adds its own voice to the narrative. It tells its own stories its histories, its uses, and the ways in which it has been lived in, but also it tells stories about us, its inhabitants, and its visitors. I integrated Inchcomb's histories, tales, legends, and superstitions into the text. The legend of the founding of Inchcomb Abbey speaks of a hermit who offered Alexander I of Scotland and his men shelter during a storm. He shared with them his cell, his cow's milk, and the shells he had gathered on the shores. In return for his hospitability, Alexander pledged to build an abbey so that refuge would always be available for those lost or seeking shelter. The east side of the island speaks of its most 
more recent history. It was a military fort built to defend the capital during the First and Second World Wars. These derelict military buildings are reclaimed by vegetation and inhabited by gulls, left in disrepair and mostly ignored by tourists. The cannon tracks in the battlement, the ammunition and supply tracks cutting lines across the island, the living barracks atop the hill, or the communication aerials all share their tales of woe. The few that do venture on this side of the island have scribbled on the walls. Messages of love, friendship and the odd obscenity have been repeatedly erased by salty winds just to be written over again by persistent hands. This is what Lorimer and Murray uh, beautifully call foundlings or found writing, ruinous folk language which talks back to authority and official signage. The west side of the island is a testament to the island's romantic and monastic history. Here its wilderness is tamed and its deserted Scot Scottish island aesthetic is carefully staged for tourists. This is where legends and histories blend, where myths and the glorious past are celebrated and put on official display. But Inchcolm is also an island carrying with it all the symbolic significance that we attach to islands. Islands have been a source of inspiration for all forms of art in all civilizations and at all times. Video games are no exception. Um, I did a search on Steam today with the keyword island, which returned 2,975 results. What do you usually think when I say island? Well, most of you probably visualize something like this. Islands are a product of volcanic activity, fissure or deposit, a drifting of the land, and maybe most importantly, a drifting of the imagination. They can be natural or man-made. They come in all shapes and sizes. They can reside on maps or in the imagination. They have been places of dispute, negotiation, exploitation and resistance. As Baldacchino beautifully sums it up, like Harry Potter's Mirror of Eri said, islands, it seems, can stand for all things desired. But island spaces are paradoxically charged, drawing attention to a vast array of dualities. Refuge prison, isolated connected, insular creative, heaven purgatory, small hidden. Islands fascinate and intimidate. The images of island abound in the media as the islands in the Mediterranean have turned into refugee camps. Islands evoke other islands, whether these are real or fictional. They are nervous dualities in that they are isolated, but at the same time connected, real and imagined, safe and dangerous. They foster tradition, but also innovation. They are paradises, but also gulags, home and exile, escape and prison, space and place. They are at the heart of discourses of sustainability and dependency, nationalism and diversity, geography and literature, desire and fear. The island space illustrates the dynamic relationship between the real and the imaginary, between individual and society, the old and the new, between the static land and the transformative water. Folklore provides a lot of examples of islands as fantastical lands where the elements of the supernatural and myth are often encountered. Places where heroes go to rest or die, places that draw the sailor in and never let him go, that appear and disappear, that live as guises of mysterious sea creatures. The island is a place of transformations and mutations, of exchanges between world, a place where the so-called savage resides, where stories of carnivorous human beings, savage practices and terrible mutations come to life. It is a place that fascinates and scares. Due to their isolation, islands are perfect place for tests and experiments, but also for creative expression. They are the testing grounds for new ideas and opportunities. Because of their size, separation from the mainland and water surroundings, islands can be easy to control and defend, but also very hard to escape. 
They have made ideal retreats, but also prisons, quarantines, asylums, as is the case in this image, and graveyards. It is perhaps unsurprising that the islands are the perfect location for video games because of their transitional nature, because they sit on this boundary between reality and fantasy, and they have fulfilled the same functions for the science fiction imagination. Inchcom summons all the island spaces, real or fictional, that the audience have previously experienced. Earlier on, I promised that I will discuss how I translated those four design uh, pillars of the arrestor to performance. So here we are there. The visual design combined environmental design strategies originating in the arrestor with the site-specific constraints and opportunities that were afforded by Inchholm Island. Applying the design lessons learned from the arrestor, I wanted the environment to reflect the story, to amplify its emotional potential, and finally to anchor the story in the audience's embodied experience. The overarching symbolic power of the island was supported at the visual micro level by interactive and non-interactive installations, tableaus designed in response to the two types of environments in the arrestor. I have come to call these scenes and shrines. The scenes, similar to the stage in theater, are activated in performance by the audience. So these are interactive environments. The shrines are the non-interactive environments. They are moments of environmental storytelling that convey additional information about the world and the character's trauma. In Inchcom project, we designed three scenes, the tree panel that you see at number one, the paper boats at number nine uh, and the tunnel at number two, and seven shrines, the hermit cell at 10, the graveyard at eight, the battlement at seven, the tea party at six, the bombed building at five, the capsized boat at four, the broken eggs at three. Um, so in total, we had 10 installation spaces. The protagonist in the Rachel has left traces in the environment for the audience to decode, just like the protagonist in the arrestor has. In each one project, this traumatic event recurs in the environment through different symbolic images. The capsized boat, the pile of buoyancy aids, the unmarked graves, the broken eggs, the wire birds caught in the fishing nets, the candles coupled with auditory cues, so either the voiceover or the live music, we supported them in conveying these emotions. I engaged with Robert Briscoe's design strategies developed in the arrestor to shape the environment as an emotional and narrative landscape. His use of macro and micro details, the subliminal signposting, and the use of dramatic elements uh, to frame and set an emotional and narrative scene were also adapted by me in Inchcon project, this time for a living body moving through a living and breathing island. Subliminal signposting engages with the environment's ability to, quote, unconsciously guide the player through some of the more figurative aspects of the story, not directly conveyed through the narrative. Because it visually represents states, feelings, memories, and thoughts, it holds the potential to contribute to an emotional connection to the story and the character's arc. In Inchcom project, the elements of environmental storytelling, similar to the arrestor, were designed to communicate this traumatic event, which explains the presence of the character on the island. So the man in the arrestor, for those of you who've not played, um, feels remorse and guilt for causing an accident in which his wife Esther and their unborn baby lost their lives. The fluorescent green or blue that keep popping up on the island allude to the liquids which spilled onto the tarmac at the site of the accident. So they're constant visual reminders of this traumatic event. Similarly, I adapted this in the Rachel where um, the man, the, the main character, witnesses the capsizing of a refugee boat and fails to rescue a woman and her infant son. And this leads him to question the humanity of our society. The thought of bringing a child into this world, because his wife Rachel is also expecting a baby, um, 
is is basically the trigger that forces him to take his own life um, and takes him to the Purgatory Island. So very similar to the story in The Arrestor. The orange here uh, alludes to the color of the life jackets and dinghies. So I've set them in parallel so you can see how the use of color um, kind of communicated this in both types of environments. The use of color in the arrestor gains symbolic and narrative significance because it acts as a visual manifestation of the memory of this traumatic event. The memory is thus projected onto the environment, causing a dramaturgical conflict. Dramaturgical basically um, just refers to meaning, um, so it cause, uh, causes a conflict with the natural landscape. Meaning becomes unstable when car parts, for example, start appearing on the island. This event is uh, represented through recurring colors, displaced and misplaced objects, and natural assemblages of natural and human-made materials. In the arrestor, the island becomes gradually coated in this fluorescent green writing, paint, car parts, emergency room paraphernalia, chemical symbols, ultrasound images alongside bird nests, broken eggs, feathers and bird bones. In the Rachel, Inchcon becomes overgrown by parasitical fluorescent orange rubber and tape, dinghies, buoyancy aids, barbed wire, metallic wind chimes, fishing nets, life jackets, wired birds alongside bark, feathers, eggshells, twigs, shells, and seaweed. In the arrestor, the fluorescent green of the accident starts taking over the island, while in Dear Rachel, the orange of the refugee crisis bleeds all over the environment. The design of a dramatic visual style in Inchcon project revolved around framing rather than creation, focusing the audience's attention on the dramatic landscape rather than creating it, as is the case uh, in the arrestor. This was achieved by tagging the audio files and positioning the installations and the musicians in um, aesthetically and dramaturgically meaningful locations. And these locations drew attention to and emphasized the island's environments and narratives. The audio file locations opened up vistas and panoramas offering views of the Firth, the shores or the island itself. They expose the island in the changing light of late afternoon and the constantly changing cloud patterns. The musicians and the installations were hosted either inside dilapidated military barracks or inside the abbey. These spaces told the stories of the island's previous uses and inhabitants, and we used the installation and the sound to kind of tease them out. The installations invited the audience to, play, uh, to pay attention to the narrative details embedded in the environment, while the panoramic vistas invited them to contemplate the emergent, ever-changing mood of the island. So the weather is what actually generated this emergent environment. Alternating between them, they could start to assemble a narrative from the dramatic landscape and the micro tableaus of environmental storytelling achieving what Briscoe called play with perspective, so the micro and the macro. Patterns emerged from the combination of the designed, natural and human elements. The audience were constantly on the move, scattered around the island, standing still on edges and shores, looking out at sea, ghostly and silent, which led to unexpected encounters and emergent landscapes. They became an active part of the landscape, contributing to each other's narratives. The physical map complemented the sonic maps map, which only allowed a limited perspective of the surroundings. Uh, so the audience could only see their physical location on a zoomed in version of the map uh, and their immediate vicinity because it's zoomed in and centered directly on their position. The physical map offered the complete representation of the island, thus providing the audience with the means to orient themselves. The map was an optional feature. They didn't have to use it um, and it could be put away and only used when they felt lost or anxious. I worked with a set and costume designer until we arrived at a map that was cryptic enough to intrigue 
and stimulate exploration, but also that was represent representational enough to actually give people the comfort of not feeling lost. The hand-drawn map um, aesthetic appealed to both me and Anna, the set designer, because we wanted to counterbalance the digital map of sonic maps with the physicality of this hand-drawn map. Um, uh, the visual references um, for this were the fictional treasure and kind of castaway maps. In terms of design, I felt that using the headphone symbol to mark the audio files, as you can see in the, the third version in the left uh, bottom corner. Um, I thought that was too literal somehow, um, and I suggested a paper boat instead, which created a semiotic connection to the world of the game. Uh, this eventually led us to the final iteration, so the bottom right one, um, which was printed out and handed to the audience upon arrival on the island. The main references for the costumes um, were the film The Shining and the imagery of World War I refugees, tying in with the narrative characters of the walkers in the arrester, but also the ghosts, uh, the walkers in the Rachel and the ghosts in the arrester, but also with the themes of refuge and displacement by war, and also with the site's history and World War I structures. So it had the military barracks and bunkers. These are just some more examples of how we worked with reference and final, the final implementation of the installations. And the paper boats, which were an, another visual connection to the arrester. Um, the audience were invited to pick up a paper boat and write a heavy thought and then launch it at sea before they embarked on the boat, which brought them back from the island. Um, so they, they function similarly to the arrester, um, where the character uh, folds his um, letters to Esther into paper balls, launching them at sea, and thus becomes free to take flight from the island. So it, they, they work as devices of kind of releasing the characters from the island by letting go of their uh, guilt. And another close up of the paper balls. Uh, we folded hundreds of uh, pages of sheet, uh, sheet music, like score music and um, and text into the paper boats. So we've arrived at narrative design. Um, the writing process for me started with breaking down the text in the arrester. Um, I wrote down the phrases and the words that would either repeat it obsessively or which created powerful and memorable images. Um, some of these later became light motifs in the Dear Rachel text, so the Hermit, Refuge, Salvation, Gulls, Ghosts, Pestilence, Death, Salt, um, and Boat Without the Bottom. So there's this kind of like traveled from one text to another. But I also worked with a set of creative constraints. Um, firstly, I wanted to write in a poetic and epistolary style that mirrors the rhythm, style, and ambiguity of the narration in the arrester, while at the same time to write in the text the island's legends and history. Uh, Inchcombe's name um, derives from Colm's Inch, alluding to its connection to Saint Columba and his visit to the island in 567 AD. Um, so the island is said to be holy and under the protection of God, uh, legends abound of the misfortune, misfortunes bestowed on its plunderers due to divine intervention. But the island also served as a burial, a burial ground and as a plague island. Uh, its reputation even reached Shakespeare, who references it in Macbeth. I also aim to write on the island uh, to respond to and to reference these environments, locations, sounds, smells, tastes, and textures. And finally, I wanted to use repetition to reinforce important information, to use phrases as refrains, thus ensuring that all audiences will listen and remember them. The fragments were written for their intended locations, conveying some of my emotional responses to these locations, as well as referencing visual, auditory, olfactory, or tactile stimuli. Uh, so for example, um, near the sewers, where there was this pungent smell, uh, the audience triggered a narrative fragment which talked about infection. 
um, or before climbing on the staircase to the radio mast, they trigger the fragment which ref reference the climb uh, and the ascent. Um, near a bench which overlooked one of the beaches, uh, they would hear of the protagonist describing his idea for a museum of traces of humanities washed ashore. Or near a, a wall where it is said that the heart of the Bishop of Dunkel is buried, they would trigger the narrative fragment which told this legend. Uh, and this again was intended to just prompt them to pay more attention to the environment and to make the connections between the site and the narrative. During the making of Inchcon project in 2016, media references to islands were dominated by photos of refugee camps enclosed with barbed wire, mountains of life vests lining the shores, and dinghy graveyards on the islands in the Mediterranean. The refugee crisis captures the conflicting nature of islands that I described earlier, as the illusion of paradise for some collides with the reality of refugee camps and the impact that they have on the lives of refugees and locals. Playing the arrester for the first time in September 2015 for me felt deeply disturbing as it coincided with the image of the lifeless body of a child, Aylan Kurdi, lying on a beach in Bodrum, Turkey, and this forced humanity to face its cold detachment. I wanted to anchor the performance into these realities, transforming the arrester's theme of individual loss and grief into a societal one. And this tied really well into Inchcom's symbolic significance as a place for meditation and ritual, a refuge for those who seek salvation. So the theme of this theme of refuge and guilt kind of connected the two islands. Because I wanted to foreground the interpretive abilities of the audience, the text was intentionally ambiguous and fragmented into 20 pieces which were scattered around the island. This challenged me to write the text in such a way that it could be experienced in any order and in any quantity, what Dan Pinchback once referred to as narrative Lego pieces. Consequently, I decided to write the text in a lyrical form, which supported the open and ambiguous narrative, as well as the episodic nature of its reception. The text, also responded to the form of mediation, namely the I developed a confessional tone of address. The text is written in the first person um, to suit the intimacy of the headphones. And I'm going to try to play you this because this probably expresses um, the how all of these threads incorporated into the text. Dear Rachel. Dear Rachel, I've been trying to find an answer to why we are here. And I think our curse goes back to Alexander and the Hermit. This abbey shall never be deserted. So refuge is always there for those in need. Those who seek salvation will always find shelter here. We have all failed at offering it in this lifetime. And so we are cursed to forever roam these shores until we manage to cleanse our guilt, forgive and forget others, and maybe most importantly, ourselves. It is a curse broken with kindness. Maybe when all the anger that I have inside has bled the island orange, I will be free to begin my journey on a paper boat without a bottom. So that I can split the sea open and with arms longer than her eyelashes reach down and pluck the orange flowers that wait for me there on the bottom of the sea. So I hope I hope this um, gave you a, a good idea of how the audio files uh, sounded, but also the, the how the, the short poems were written. Um, and I also hope that for for those of you who are familiar with the text of, of um, 
the arrestor uh, kind of created a familiarity um, between the two texts. Um, I also casted the audience uh, as ghosts on the island, um, the walkers who are cursed to wander until they repent and find peace. Um, the, uh, the island as purgatory interpretation from the arrestor um, does kind of traveled in here as well. Um, the audience became each other's ghosts, contributing to each other's narratives. So by watching others perform, for example, seeing other audience members in the distance, engaging with an audio file or an installation, the participants could decide to go there themselves and potentially becoming the performer for the next audience. Um, and this is reminiscent of the ghosts in the arrestor where the player is constantly following in their footsteps but never really manages to reach them as they always disappear when she approaches them. The elusive figure of the ghost was behind the concept of collectively casting the audience as the walkers, others who walk on the island searching for redemption. This was repeatedly referenced in the text. Most of the audio files which reference the encounters with the other walkers were tagged in locations where these encounters were likely. That's kind of like doubling up that interpretation. The sound was designed to mirror the multi-layered texture of the arrestor sound soundscape. So we had music, diegetic sounds, and the acousmatic male eye voice, which was speaking in their ear. We also use sound to focus attention to the environment by amplifying it. Um, and this anchored the sound, the environment, and the narrative in the body, creating moments in which the information um, becomes personally meaningful. The sound responded to the site, so we did numerous field recordings, but also to the game. So in the way in which we layered the diegetic and the non-diegetic sound, which mirrored the arrestor sound design, um, and to the narrative. So sound effects were used to reinforce the interpretation that the voices this ethereal remain echoing through time. Uh, the form of delivery via headphones facilitated both an intimate and isolating experience, um, whilst at the same time it was easily pierced through by environmental sound. The function of sound in Inchcom was threefold. Uh, it created an omnipresent fictional space, so everything that the audience encountered gained narrative and semiotic uh, potential and led to emergent narrative. So a good example here is um, a story that I heard from some of the audience that found um, a random note on the east side of the island that wasn't connected to the performance in any way. But then everything that they heard, all the installations that they encountered, um, kind of fed into their interpretation and the narrative that they made themselves to account for this one little note that they found on the side of the island. Um, the second function was that it was a quick and efficient way of establishing a fictional world and communicating its rules. So the second, the audience descended um, on Inchcom Island, the first audio file would start playing thus fictionalizing that space. Um, and finally, it imposed the rhythm and the pattern of movement. So the position of the audio files and the installations was carefully selected to facilitate a, a diverse and sensory stimulating walk. The sound files would play in certain uh, circular area visible to the audience in their sonic maps app. Um, and if the audience would leave that area before the end of the audio, the sound would just stop. Um, however, the diameter of these areas uh, varied quite a bit, so it was from 2 meters to 10 meters, which gave the participants enough freedom to, to still listen um, on the move if they chose to, at least for a while. Um, and this influenced the rhythm, the pattern and the pace of movement and increased the number of choices available to the audience, so to listen or to move. The sound of radio static, uh, as you heard in the previous audio file, was used to mark the beginning and the end of transmission, thus signaling to the audience that the voiceover was about to start or on the contrary to end. And this supported an element of expectation, giving the audience time to settle into an active listening mode. The static frame, the audio signaling um, that what the audience were hearing was a fragment, a trace that somehow still lingered in the environment. And together, the audio files created a sonic ruin, an eclectic composition of sound textures, rhythms, and surfaces, um, as Misha Myers once beautifully called it, 
narrative debris drifting on radio waves. Um, in each one project, the ruined landscape is mirrored in this ruined soundscape and their fragmented, open and broken nature requiring interpretive effort, asking the audience to fill in the gaps. And this is how they become interactive. And this is where I'm really attracted to this type of experiences as a dramaturg. Um, music was added in specific sound files to support the emotional tone of the voice um, and give a sense of emotional progression. We used music from the Dear Esther soundtrack to ensure continuity between the world of the game and the world of the performance. The musicians were performing instrumental solos from Always, arranged by Lucy Holland and David Jamieson in various locations around the island. Um, the instrumental solos were echoes of the musical theme, isolated voices in a disjointed and parallel dialogue that have not yet found musical unity. I have come to refer to them as musical puzzle pieces scattered around the island, gathered by the audience and assembled through the musical performance at the end. Uh, so to give you an example of this, the song Always was first heard in the headphones, but then it was also heard on the island um, and then simultaneously on the island and in the headphones as the two types of soundscapes kind of bled into one another. Um, and this type of overlap would normally take place when the audience triggered an audio file, which was close to where a musician was performing. Um, so finally, they heard the, the uh, song again during the, the projection of the game. Um, and finally, it was assembled in its final form in the live musical performance. So this is how this kind of musical theme traveled across the components of the event. Um, Stopping, walking, standing and listening are woven together, creating a rhythm of the lived experience on Inchcon project. So in both the Arrestor and the Rachel, walking is the main form of interaction with the design story world. Um, in Inchcon project, I intended to design opportunities for walking either alone or with others. The environment, the narrative and the sound were all designed to be experienced and interacted with through walking and at the same time offering the motivation for it. Um, they enable different rhythms of walking, exposing the moving body to the stories, texture, sound, smell, sea and landscapes of Inchcolm. Technology also played a part um, as groups sometimes shared their phones. Um, so the phone and the length of the cable um, of the splitter limited their movement and their speed turning progression into a negotiation with the technology, with each other and with the terrain, um, as you can see in the last photo there. Inchcon's state of dereliction and abandonment, particularly felt on the east side of the island, also influenced the rhythm of walking. So the ground underfoot constantly changes and the paths are overgrown, collapsed or otherwise interrupted which forces the walker to find alternate routes or to change course or to devise and improvise new ways of getting around. She needs to stay alert, to pay attention to the environment and deploy all of her senses in the process of wayfinding. Walking thus became improvisational in negotiating the crumbling ground underfoot and the collapsed structure, but also a kind of playful subversion of what had previously been a highly regulated space. So these were military buildings um, with its productive rhythms and patterns of movement. Uh, in gaming terminology, Inchon Project was designed to support different types of co-located play experiences. Um, so single player, two player technology dependent, um, where they share the phone, to player technology independent where people would walk together even if they didn't share the, the one phone. Uh, multiplayer technology dependent and multiplayer technology independent. Although the multiplayer option initially stemmed from technological constraints, so the Sonic Maps app at the time had no support for Windows phones and it had limited functionality of Android phones. Um, it ultimately depended on the willingness of participants to share their phones with friends and even strangers. Being a loosely adapted text, Dear Rachel was a constant negotiation between those types of texts that I mentioned at the beginning, between the source text and between the potential text. 
This potential text was equally shaped by the site, so its symbolic potential added another dramaturgical layer to the narrative. Its stories and histories were embodied by its environment, and its physical appearance constantly shaped the structure of the text. These three functions that were central to my development um, as symbol, as structure, and as storyteller shaped the text by guiding its reception, where it was experienced, by shaping its themes, the text was site responsive and by aiding its semiotic and sensory interpretation. The symbolism of the island as refuge and prison eventually grew into the theme of the performance. So this is just a short um, recap of what I stated earlier. The process of adaptation required a parallel process of dramaturgy, which in short coherence of meaning across different types of environment, physical and virtual, and uh, across these um, mixed media components, so promenade performance, projection, and musical performance. And this involved two types of processes, pruning or removing everything which could offset the meaning making process, but also devising, so adding an improvisational, uh, improvisational type of assemblage. Instead of a conclusion, I offer you a summary of how some of the DRSTER design strategies were translated and adapted for Inchcomb. And hopefully, I also offer you um, the two videos which are going to speak for themselves. Dear Rachel, Dear Rachel. we have all found refuge on this island. Kings and hermits, shepherds and soldiers, sinners and holy men. We are all equally real and equally imagined. This island, the abbey, those blocks up on the hill, they pose no threat to our imagination. They just put it on and wear it like a life jacket. Humans Gulls and ghosts have lived and died on this island. We are the last in a long line of refugees. The walkers stepping on the consecrated ground that burns our feet. We have shunned the world, and in doing so, the world has shunned us back. We walk the shores, the caves and the hills, It seems that we are again experiencing some minor technical difficulties, but. OK, broken like the waves that hold us. There is no salvation here. Only walls. And the team uh, without whom I would have never been able to pull this off. Um, and I think that is me. Thank you so much for listening. And yeah, let's move to the more fun and interactive part, which are the questions. <laughs> this was this was this was very fun. And and thank you, Mona, so much for your for your great lecture. Now that you've taken us behind the scenes and actually showed us your all the processes and all the research and all the teamwork that went into making this happen, it is even more impressive. So um, thank you so much. And I'm sure that all the attendees are are appreciating this as, as much as I am. Um, I just wanted to ask you uh, how much time did it, uh, how much time went into making this happen actually? Uh, how, how, um, for how many months were you researching? And uh, after you've done your research, um, how much time did uh, you and your team take to build uh, the sets, the costumes, to get the actors to organize everything? Um, yeah, I think uh, the research, the site visits, all the kind of pre-production things took the longest. So I was finding the partners as well because we had no budget. 
Um, so it was just a matter of kind of enthusing people and kind of trying to uh, make an appeal to their passion. Hey, do you want to go to an island and do something crazy? <laughs> Would that be fun? Um, so that's how I kind of gradually managed to get collaborators, people who are like genuinely excited about exploring this kind of overlaps. So I guess I, I started I, I would say between 10 months and a year of, of kind of research and alongside PhD work. So it kind of took time, um, but also the site scouting phase. So having to visit all, all of the islands. Um, and these were accessible at certain times of the year as well, because sometimes the seagulls would be nesting, for example, and you could not get to one side of the island and all these like absolutely you couldn't make it up. Uh, details um, and then once we kind of like we had to have everything ready to go um, and ready to be installed as quickly as possible because we didn't have a lot of time on the island so um, the um, uh, the island is administered by Historic Environment Scotland um, and they had certain times where where kind of uh, tourist boats could get onto the island um, so we had to make best use of that. So we had like four hours to set up uh, in the middle of a storm at sea. Uh, the project manager was seasick, so she couldn't do anything and she knew where everything went. So it was it was a bit of a, a blur, the entire kind of setup. Um, but everything ran smoothly and I think it's because I had these amazing people helping me out and kind of having my back every step of the way. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome to be surrounded with people who who have your who have your back at at, at all times. Um, how did the audience or players uh, respond to the project? And also, uh, did you collect any uh, type of feedback, maybe form of uh, type of feedback from them? And uh, if yes, like what uh, what feedback was most help helpful in? In improving in improving the project and also uh, um, most help, helpful in terms of help uh, designing your next uh, next experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we did uh, post show discussions because I think everybody needed a uh, strong drink after <laughs> two hours of so kind of like storm on an island. Um, so we did a post show discussion where people moderated um uh, themselves in teams and discuss the experience and aspects that they found particularly immersive how they perceive the two experiences whether they they'd seen them as part of a one holistic experience and if not what could be done um and i think some of the most exciting things that came out of it from my perspective was the fact that speaking with participants uh, years after the project, they were telling me that now they can't play the arrestor without smelling the sea. Um, so uh, there was almost like a, a kind of um, a transfer of sensory information from from them seeing the game being played on the island and experiencing something very similar to it, to this transfer of sensory information. So I guess from a, from a research point of view, it'd be really, really interesting to see how we can actually develop more ways in which we can kind of like contaminate gameplay with sensory information, if you will. Um, but yeah, so these were some of the things that were discussed and also the fact that, that as I was telling the story there earlier on, like people enjoyed exploring it. Some some people were big fans of the arrester, so they kind of approached it like I want to get away from the rest of the people and just go and explore by myself. Other people had different strategies, almost like gameplay strategies. Yes, we have to dodge the group and just move on by ourselves. Uh, we need to go in the other direction than the other players. Some people were more focused on gathering them all, so getting all the 22 audio files and running around to kind of make sure that they've got them all. Um, they were being competitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you you can't take that out of a, a kind of pseudo gaming experience, I guess. Uh, but they were still doing the you know like Pokemon and get them all um, <laughs> thing. Um, and that was fine. I guess it was fine, and it was fine that um, people used the post show discussion to to do that 
you know, collective intelligence thing to, to kind of like make sense of it together and be like, oh, I've not seen that. Did you see that? Oh, what did you make of that? And it was really nice. And I really love the fact that we can create experiences that, that make more sense when we're together. Um, awesome. One of the members in the audience asked if you could share your thoughts of uh, on escape rooms. And what about escape islands, Mona? <laughs> Here's the challenge. <laughs> um, yeah, so immersive theater, escape rooms, um, LARPs, um, ARGs, all of these like augmented reality games, all of these were, were related practices that I looked at as I was developing my PhD. So um, I find them excellent and I think they're an absolutely brilliant way in which we, we we combine these two different types of experiences. Um, immersive theaters are the same, you know, they're, they're expansive environments in which you can get lost and discover sensory experiences and discover moments of dance and you're free to kind of navigate them whichever way you want. And, and I think, yeah, I think gaming in in the real world you know when when we start bringing it into the real world outside of the bedrooms becomes really interesting because it requires some form of adaptation and and yeah behaviors change a little bit you know it's it's really exciting so yeah awesome awesome since we actually are running out of time mona the the interactive part of our of our webinar uh, has to has to stop unfortunately but still i'm sure that uh, anyone can reach out uh, uh, reach out using the email address and your uh, and your twitter as well and ask uh, all the questions uh, about immersive design narrative design and like bridging the and and I don't know bridging the gap between the the, the theater and and video games. It's it it, it is a, a very very interesting subject. Something that we haven't had a chance to uh, to, to to talk about uh, here at, at Play UK. So um, again, I would like to thank you so much for your for your lecture today. It has. Uh, it, it has been really really great. I know that I have I have learned a lot. Thank you so much for for sharing and uh, I also want to up. This has been your first online online webinar, so congrats on that. <laughs> you you survived you survived uh, the the bad Internet, so all is all is good. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for for making sure that everything ran smoothly. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure and I'm I was really looking forward for a long time to um, to do this with you guys. So yeah, it's great. Thank you so much. Awesome. We surely will uh, uh, I don't know, find a way to talk to you again and to share more about the, the projects you've done uh, after uh, after after dear, dear Rachel. Those are those are interesting as well. Um, so that's it for today. I would uh, like to thank um, Again, Mona, then all the attendees, and also uh, a big thanks goes to all British Council partners in the West Balkan region who are helping us bring this content to you. Uh, we will make sure that you get this uh, recorded session uh, in the following days. Also, we will send you a feedback form and we would uh, greatly appreciate if you would fill, fill it out and share your thoughts uh, about these, uh, these sessions. Uh, we will continue to produce inspiring content and we really hope that the talk um, we prepare uh, will motivate you, motivate you to explore the gaming industry. Um, again, thank you all for being uh, with us today uh, and see you soon. Bye. Bye.